Most divided souls are contradictions. The good, the bad, the saintly and the cruel, the righteous and the pusillanimous. And somehow they muddle through with the contradictions rudely synthesizing themselves in a typically tormented dialectic with each other long enough for them to do their art but too long for them to last. Hank Williams was born in Mount Olive, Alabama in 1923. His parents were Mother Lily, a cruel and domineering woman who constantly tore Hank down as a child and robbed him blind when he started bringing money in, and his dad Lon, a logger and cropper who was injured during a hitch in the US Army and spent most of his later life in army hospitals. Lon never tried to exploit or make any claim on Hank's fame and when he told Lily to lay off Hank, Lily beat him up as well. Hank had a younger sister, Irene, whose disgraceful story we'll tell later. Lily ran boarding houses, and some say whorehouses, in and around Montgomery, Alabama, through the Depression. So the family was spared the worst privations of poverty, but life was still tough. Hank was drinking hard by 13. No doubt his mother's neglect and abuse were a huge factor in this, but so was the fact that Hank just liked being drunk, and the booze eased the pain of his congenital spina bifida. The spina bifida pain would lead him down to a later addiction to morphine and occasional binges on heroin. Hank put together the first incarnation of his band The Drifting Cowboys in 1939, quit school and headed off down that lost highway to wherever it would take him. Hank Williams, perhaps American popular music's most divided and misunderstood soul, varied from this stream in one crucial area. Vices fed his strengths and his strengths promulgated themselves through his vices. He knew he'd never get out of this world alive, and he didn't. The Lost Highway took Hank to a fame seldom achieved in country music and a legend, for better or worse, seldom rivaled in all of popular music. In barely five years, he had 11 number one country hits, 27 top tens and three other top twenties. Everything he released between December 1948 and September 1953 made the top ten at least. He even wrote a number one pop hit for Tony Bennett. Bob Dylan, in his dubious autobiography, says that he heard Hank on the Grand Ole Opry in the early 50s up in Hibbing, Minnesota. Bob says he was unaware that Hank was a songwriter at the time, which sounds legit, and he simply knew Hank as the greatest singer he'd ever heard. That raises another interesting point often neglected in the cult of Hank Williams, that he covered almost as many songs by other people as he wrote his own. Dear John, setting the woods on fire, my bucket's got a hole in it, take these chains from my heart, half as much, wedding bells, lost highway, and even his biggest record, Lovesick Blues, were all hits that would have made another singer's legend, and they all exist outside the corpus of his songwriting. A lot of those songs were written by Fred Rose, his producer and mentor and a devout Christian who tried to keep Williams on the straight and narrow. But even he had to cut Hank loose at the end of 1952 because he could see what so many others had come to see. Williams was beyond salvation. Wherever he was going, he was going there because he wanted to. His demons were his, and they, more than Rose, were his counsel, courage and comrades. Hank said he saw the light, but he lied. All Hank could see was a looming darkness. The great mystery of Hank Williams is that, apart from the moments he froze in songs, we know next to nothing about him. He left us no journal, he left no diaries, no extended interviews, and there were no reliable biographical accounts of him in his lifetime, untainted by people's interest in grubbing money from his memory. Look at the confused and tangled stories of events around the night of his death. It's like Rashomon. Hank Williams met Audrey Shepard when he was playing in a tent show in Banks, Alabama in 1943 and was thunderstruck by her auburn hair beauty. Audrey was desperate to get into show business, despite the not insignificant handicap of being one of the worst singers God ever put breath into. They married in mid-1944 at a Texaco station in Covington County, Alabama. That marriage was annulled because Audrey had neglected to tell Hank about the small matter of her already being married with a daughter. Over the objections of the then set of drifting cowboys and in violation of the golden rule never let your old lady in the band, Audrey was added as a featured vocalist and occasional bass player. Within a few years Audrey found the easier way to fame and fortune was simply to rob Hank blind at every opportunity. 
so she became an infrequent guest performer but a full-time manager, taking over from Lily, which triggered an eternal enmity. Hank remarried to Billie Jean Jones in October 1952 in another invalid marriage. Jones's divorce hadn't become final. Hank had also fathered a daughter who was born days after he died, Antha Jet Williams, a singer-songwriter in her own right who's variously been described as awful, atrocious and more ordinary than Hank. Jet had a rough time of it. Once her mother had seen her meal ticket roll up dead, she kicked Antha to the curb only for it to be adopted by the monstrous Lily. Six months later and Lily is dead, so Irene, seeing a meal ticket, took Antha in. No meal ticket, so Irene had the poor kid made a ward of the state. Speaks volumes as to Hank's sister's character. Every form of music has its doomed archetype. Jazz has its ill-starred princes who were too beautiful to live. Rock and roll, it's drug-crazed, daughter-defiling highway to Helsters. Hip-hop has its street punk with talent who can't escape the hood and perishes at the hands of his enemies. And country music, it's good old boy hell-raisers who every man in the audience would be if only he could. Charlie Poole may have been the first legendary hell-raiser, but Charlie did it because he had nothing to lose and was never going to have anything to lose. Hank and his songs, though, could have been the way out of the social dead end of country music, a way that took the music another 20 years to find by itself. He could have been a founder of rockabilly, or even folk music. He could have gone on to write more pop hits. But he chose to go his own way. And it was a broad path he chose, over the narrow way. In late 1952, William sought a cure for his drinking. He couldn't have chosen a worse one. Treatment from a charlatan who bought his medical degree from a travelling salesman at a gas station in Oklahoma about a year before. How appropriate that Hank Williams, who met his muse nemesis Audrey when he was singing on a medicine show and was a star of a nationwide Haddocol caravan, should put his faith in a snake oil shuckster. Only Toby Marshall was peddling something far more noxious than honey, herb and ethanol. The treatment Marshall prescribed was 100% guaranteed to put old Hank in his grave, and quickly. No less than chloral hydrate, which was meant as an aversion diversion therapy for Williams' drinking, but was also an accumulative drug in the system, and after a matter of weeks, Hank's drinking became a game of Russian roulette, which, combined with his mounting heart problems, was going to kill him very much sooner rather than later. As it happens, a shot of morphine in Knoxville, Tennessee was to be the catalyst of a perfect storm of drug intoxication that ultimately did for him. Old Hank sang a lot of sad songs, but You Win Again is the saddest of them all. Recorded in barely half an hour in a hotel room in Nashville on the day after his and Audrey's divorce became final, Hank seems almost transparent in this song. The simple yet obvious lyrics serving seemingly as placeholders, not for his voice, but for the raw stuff that other artists might fashion as voice. It is a communion with the highest and basest things in us, which we fear most, but know we would die without. The final fall of man is not the admission in the closing line of, you win again, it's in the line before that, the pathetic, utterly defeated, I love you still. That's when we know that old Hank ain't coming back from this. Much is written and mythologized about Hank's final fatal ride on New Year's Eve 1952, trying to make a gig in snowbound Canton, Ohio. Why he'd taken the gigs remains something of a mystery. It was a package tour, so even though they were selling out 4,000 seat venues, the money wouldn't have been great, and Hank was flushed with money in any case, as he had the number one single on the country charts at the time, I'll Never Get Out of This World Alive. Nevertheless, perhaps he just wanted to get away from the drama in Montgomery with Lily, the upcoming birth of Antha, although he had paid everyone in full for delivering the child in case he wasn't back in time to pay them. Audrey's constant demands for money. He hired a chauffeur, Charles Carr, a college student, to drive, and they lit out in a baby blue 1952 Cadillac 62, a bad omen Hank usually insisted on travelling in Packards. Williams left around 1.30 on the 29th, but he had to hustle up some morphine before he left. 
Eventually, Toby Marshall hooked him up with a doctor who would write him a script, provided he stayed off the source for the rest of the trip. Groggy from being doped up, William sent Carr for sandwiches, coffee and a six-pack of Falstaff beer. They finally left Montgomery around 1700. Snow had started to fall. They stayed the night at the Redmond Hotel in Birmingham where Carr got a parking ticket. There they met some young ladies and whiled away an hour in their room with them. Williams inquired of one young lady as to where it was she was from. Heaven, she said. Oh darling, Hank replied, you might just be the reason I end up going to hell. They ate dinner and had a good night's sleep. They made Chattanooga by lunch, Hank having stopped in Fort Payne to buy a bottle of bourbon and ate at a diner where Hank played Tony Bennett's Cold Cold Heart on the jukebox and, according to legend, left the waitress a $50 tip. This seemed a little too good to be true. Soon they were in Knoxville and Hank decided to fly on to Charleston where his first gig was scheduled, but shortly into the flight the weather was too bad. As it happened, the gig had been cancelled anyway and Hank got the word to go straight to the other gig at Canton where 4,000 people awaited. Here's where things get hazy. Seemed as he was, Hank did still have an ace up his sleeve. At his last ever recording session in September 1952, he used his two hours to cut I Can Never Be Ashamed of You, Take These Chains From My Heart, Call Liger, and Your Cheatin' Heart. His personal life may have been in flames at this point, but he was leaving 1952 as the biggest selling artist in country music and he had two massive hits in the can to start 1953 with. Twist is, in your cheating heart, he'd found as much an anthem in death as lovesick blues had been his anthem in life. This session, and the time that he recorded the demo in a post office in upcountry Alabama, were the only two times he ever sang this song. According to Carr, Hank visited a hospital before the flight and was able to catch another shot of morphine. He also finished his bottle of bourbon, so he was in pretty bad state when they made it to the Andrew Johnson Hotel, porters having to assist him in walking to his room. They reported him as being in a good mood, chatting incoherently with them, but passing on one word of advice. When you drink like me, he told them, this is the price you gotta pay. Williams and Carr ate room service steaks and Williams developed a bad case of hiccups, so much so that they resembled convulsions, which they most likely were. Carr had a doctor sent up who gave Williams a B12 shot and another quarter grain of morphine. Some reports say two. It's possible that Williams had died or was dying when he left the hotel that evening. But the porters who brought him in say they talked with him and when they took him out in a wheelchair around 22.45 on December 30th, he was still chatty. On the road again in bone chilling weather, car ploughed ahead for the best part of eight hours, going through the Rutledge Pike and into West Virginia. Car was by this time exhausted. Around 1am, Carr crossed onto the wrong side of the road and narrowly avoided hitting a sheriff's vehicle. One of the policemen commented that the guy in the back seat looked dead. Neither policeman, however, bothered to check. Instead of writing a ticket, the cops took Carr into Bluefield to have him arraigned by a magistrate, leaving Hank in the back seat of the freezing Cadillac. Around 4.30, they stopped at Bluefield where Carr says Williams got out to stretch his leg, declining the offer of coffee or sandwiches. In the Skyline Diner in Bluefield, Carr arranged for Don Surface, a local cabbie, to take over driving through the dangerous mountain passes. As they left, Hank woke and asked Carr to find a doctor for another shot of morphine. This is the last point at which he can be, if Carr is to be believed, confirmed alive. They stopped around 6 o'clock for coffee in Princeton. Hank was out cold in the back. A half hour later, they stopped at Oak Hill for petrol. Carr noticed Hank's blanket had fallen off. It was then that he realised something was very wrong. He ran into the petrol station and summoned the attendant, who took one look at Williams and turned to Carr and said, I think you've got a problem. Carr took Williams to the Oak Hill Hospital, where he begged the attendants to revive him. Why? They said, sotto voce. He's dead. That's it. Carr then called Lily. Her response was, don't let anything happen to the car. Probably the worst mistake country music ever made was to make a saint out of Hank Williams. But Hank's rolling up dead in the boondocks gave Nashville 
Audrey and the other egregious hangers-on the perfect opportunity to build the first cult of Hank. The Christ-like figure who lived the life of all our joys and pains and sins and wrote them down and died out there on the road trying to commune with us. Of course, what they never said was that Hank didn't die for our sins, he died for his own sins, and it's highly likely that he enjoyed every single one of them. As with any artist who dies young, the inevitable question is, what would have happened if he'd lived? With Hank, the answer is simple. If not that freezing New Year's Eve on West Virginia 19, then he'd have been gone the next day, the next week, the next month, the next time he had a beer. The odds of him surviving as long as his 30th birthday even were impossibly slim. I asked Hank Williams, how lonesome does it get? Hank Williams hasn't answered me yet. Leonard Cullen. From the mid-1980s, the current cult of Hank emerged largely as the making of Hank Williams Jr., an unctuous goblin whose constant evocation of his father totters between the pathetic and nauseating. It de-emphasizes and objectifies the songs and celebrates William's dissolute and feckless lifestyle. Somehow this equates to what is real, as opposed to a world where country music is increasingly emasculated, divorced from its roots, and frankly, bourgeois. The great irony of this is that Hank was country. Country in a way these corporate kids that think they have something to do with him and his legacy these days never will be. I mean, Hank got his first guitar through selling peanuts on the street in Montgomery, Alabama during the Depression. Taylor Swift is the daughter of a Merrill Lynch vice president. I think that fact alone makes my point. The real heroes in Hank's story are the songs. Every element of humour, honour, pain, lostness, misery, joy, hope, lust, despair, rage and dignity laid out for us in plain, frank, occasionally very beautiful language and sung with one of the last authentic voices of the American South. If you ever need to know anything about old Hank, forget about that last car ride. Go straight to the songs. <laughs> 